organisms that do not grow with oxygen, we can grow them in different environments. And what we do is we grow them in environments that will allow us to reduce the quantity of oxygen that we provide to them. So one way to do it, as you see in this picture, is an anaerobic jar. And the anaerobic jar looks something like this. So here goes the anaerobic jar. It comes with um, this metal apparatus here, and you can use this to hold petri dishes that have organisms on them. Um, you could also um, add different things inside this jar that you want to grow without oxygen. So once you put all your um, organisms that you're ready to grow in an anaerobic environment, um, you will, it will look something like this. So here are the petri dishes that, again, we've already added our, our bacteria or organisms to the, the, our bacteria to the petri dishes. We place them in the jar, and once we place them in the jar, as you can see, this jar is empty right now. Before we um, close the jar, we put an envelope in the jar, and that envelope has special chemicals. So I do have an envelope um, here today, and I do have a Okay, yes. So here goes an envelope, and I don't know if you can see it from here. Maybe some of you guys can see it in the front, but this says. Um, from Beckton and Dixon, BD, um, gas pack, an anaerobic container system with indicator. And this particular, um, this particular envelope, um, similar to the one you see in the diagram, has chemicals that will allow us to remove all the oxygen from the environment once we close the container. So uh, right now, I'm not going to open the gas pack because once I open it, then the chemicals start to bind with oxygen, and then it's a waste of this particular um, gas pack, which can be used at another time. But inside the gas pack, if I squeeze and I squeeze and I squeeze, I can feel, it is not a ready crush, but I had this one so long, I can feel the anaerobic indicator. And the anaerobic indicator, which is methylene blue, um, we're using this in this experiment. And usually with Many biology experiments, we use indicators. Right. So what is the purpose of an indicator? What does an indicator do? Well, these indicators allow us to detect changes. And the change that we want to detect in our condition is, we want to, is that we want to detect when the conditions go from relatively having oxygen to without oxygen, no oxygen. All right, so this methylene blue indicator that we have, it's like a tablet, feels, if you feel it in that, that anaerobic envelope, it feels like a little aspirin tablet, and the color will go from white to blue once the oxygen levels are removed. Are, are reduced, right, and that are, are gone, eliminated. So here I have it, if we look at the jar, here goes my anaerobic jar. Again, my envelope, uh, be, um, before I close the jar, of course, I would want to make sure I open, the, open this up and I would place it inside, again, with my organisms that I'm trying to grow. Remember, the organism would be on the Petri dish. And here is the lid for my anaerobic jar, and here is the cover and you will screw this tight at the top, all right? So once you screw it tight, right, there will be no oxygen that will get into the container, but the oxygen that is in the container, right, that will be collected and removed by the envelope that I placed inside, eliminating all the oxygen that can affect the growth of our obligate anaerobes. So this is what the jar looks like. So again, this jar will allow me to grow our obligate animals without oxygen. We want to make sure that we grow them without oxygen. When, when I, or after I grow my organisms for a few days, what I will look for is that my indicator has turned blue, 
right? So if I get, when I get my jar after it grows for a few, a few days, I will look to see what color my indicator is. And if I see my indicator has turned blue, then of course I know that my conditions have been met. If the indicator is still white, then I know there's something wrong with my and, and experimental design. So I would want to repeat that experiment. What other organisms can we grow in this condition? So you want to go back to the slide before and look at what other groups of organisms can we grow in this particular condition. Yes, well we can grow our aerotolerant anaerobes, right? Because they don't care if oxygen is available enough or not. And there's one other. Yes, the facultative. Because they can grow with or without oxygen. So these are the two groups of organisms that can grow in these conditions. So if you look at some of the examples on the previous slide, things like Staphylococcus E. coli, bacillus, we can grow in this container and they will grow. But um, they will grow because they can grow with or without oxygen. But this is, of course, best for growing the obligate anaerobes because we absolutely have to remove all oxygen from the environment so that way they can grow. If oxygen is present, they do not grow at all. So um, moving on to our, uh, moving on in our talk again, when we're growing our microorganisms, one, we have to consider how fast they are growing. We also need to consider, do they require oxygen or not? And then we want to give them the right type of media and remember media culture media means nutrients all right so that word media that we see here means nutrients and there's different types of media the one in this diagram sorry once so the one here glucose minimal salt broth all right so broth would be liquid all right so this liquid broth is chemically defined and um, it is chemically defined because we know the exact chemical composition and all the chemicals, we know the chemical formula for all of the ingredients that are added. Right, so we know the ratio of how much carbon, how much nitrogen, how much oxygen, how much of all these elements are provided to the organism, and we can grow, we can use glucose minimal broth to grow organisms like E. coli because they have been well studied, and we have narrowed down exactly what, what are the specific ingredients they use to survive and what will allow them to grow optimally. So the for glucose minimal salt broth, the way how we prepare it, we would we would first um, we would take our or gather all of our ingredients, right? It's almost like cooking, right? You gather all of your ingredients. So the ingredients here: are glucose, sodium chloride, um, ammonium dihydrogen phosphate, sodium potassium phosphate, and magnesium phosphate. So in this case, you have glucose. Glucose is a carbohydrate. All right. From this container, you would this container. You will get it in a container. Um, you will purchase this from a chemical company um, in a in a biology lab. If you're working, you purchase from chemical, not from a regular supermarket. You go and get a, these ingredients from a chemical company. And glucose, you would measure it. You weigh it, and you get 0.5 grams. Right. You would then measure your salt. So there's four salts. Right? Sodium chloride will come in another container. You measure 0.5 grams. Then you will go to your next salt. You measure it. You weigh it 0.1 gram. Dipotassium phosphate 0.1 gram. And then magnesium sulfate um, you would measure at 0.02 grams. So those are all your salts. Some of them you have at, may have at home. Um, sodium chloride, the common name for that is table salt. All right, these two salts 
you wouldn't have your own. Um, and, um, but they all have this crystal-like formation um, that you will appearance, all the crystals of different salts will look differently. And magnesium sulf sulfate, some of you guys might have this in your home. Um, this is Epsom salt. And you would weigh all of your salts, right? Of course, you don't buy any of these at a supermarket. You buy them from a chemical company, you weigh them all, and then you add them to water. And this will be at 100 ml, right? So 100 ml, um, you have a small quantity of liquid broth that these organisms, especially E. coli, will use for growth. Okay? Complex media is different from chemically defined media because of the composition. So in nutrient broth, so if we're looking at nutrient broth, in nutrient broth, the chemical ingredient that we have, um, you would have peptone, beef extract, um, and you also have in this sodium chloride, right? And we add plus water, right? But most importantly, in our complex media, what, what makes this completely different from the chemically defined media, once we add peptone and beef extract to the media, those are extracts and digests that are coming from organisms, live organisms, and we add it to the media, and we don't know the exact chemical composition of those ingredients. We don't know how much um, protein, how much carbon, how much hydrogen, what's the ratio of those elements in those ingredients. We have no idea. But when we add peptone, which is a partially digested protein and beef extract, we know there are nutrients in there that the organism can use to grow. So that's the most important thing, that they have something in order to grow. We don't know exactly what it is, but it is sufficient to grow um, many organisms. And in the laboratory, especially our microbiology laboratory, that's used to grow most of our bacteria, all right? So most of the bacteria are grown there, whether it's E. coli, um, Staphylococcus, um, Bacillus, it's just easier to use that one, me one um, that one medium or media, the nutrient broth or, or agar, it's just easier to use those to grow many different types of organisms instead of glucose broth, which is very specific. It may only grow certain organisms, um, and it might only grow very few organisms. So that's something that you want to consider when you're growing your organisms. So again, looking at what are we going to give these organisms in order to grow, and we want to give them um, nutrients that contain elements that will support the, sh the growth and that will support the growth of that organism. So in order to make our liquid medium, remember medium means nutrient, into solid medium, we add agar, right? So we add agar at 1.5 1, 1. gram at 1.45 gram for, per 100 ml, right? So it's a very, very small amount that we're adding. And agar, when we add it, it will turn this into solid. So this, so agar, what it is, is a carbohydrate. It comes in powder form. We purchase it from a chemical company, and we add it to all of our ingredients, so that way we can make solid. And there's some benefits that we'll talk about for using agar. But when we make this solid media, it's similar to making jello at home. Where jello, um, what's in jello is a component, a, a substance or an ingredient, we say a substance called gelatin. And gelatin is a protein, right? So instead, agar is a carbohydrate. Okay. So some other, so some similarities and differences between um, agar and jello. So let's talk a little bit about how you make jello at home. Well, so how would you do it? All right. Of course, you purchase jello from the store. You don't get it from a chemical company. And yes, yeah, so you would take it and you would dissolve it in water. So you add water usually hot water, 
And when you add the hot water, what happens? It dissolves. All right, so this powder, you will dissolve it. And then what's the next step? Yes, yeah, so then you would place in the cold, so usually you place it in the refrigerator, and it turns into the gel or the solid. But in the case of agar, which we use for our solid, making our solid medium, for our solid media, this carbohydrate, we do the same thing, it's a powder, similarly, um, and we add it to hot water. To dissolve. And to make it solid, we don't have to place it in the re refrigerator, so we just place it at room temperature. And then it will become solid. So that's one, it's very easy to work with with this um, solid, but there's with this, um, agar, with this agar component, but there's many benefits to using agar. One of them is not metabolized by our microorganisms. So what does that mean? Yes, yeah, so that means that they don't metabolize, metabolize in this case, meaning that they don't break it down, so it's not used as food. They don't break it down. So the next thing about agar benefit is that you can heat it up. Once it solidifies, you can heat it up and you can convert it into liquid. And that liquid, um, then you can use it um, and pour it into different different um, containers. So in this case, for um, in this case, when you convert it into liquid, um, one way you can convert it into a liquid is by heating it in the microwave. And once you heat it in the microwave, then you let it cool slightly. And then we can pour it into the Petri dish. So our Petri dishes, they... are made of this polish cream, which is like a plastic-like material, and it looks something like this. So here's your Petri dish, and your Petri dish, as you can see, is a container, one container. There are sterile containers. Of course, once you open them, not sterile anymore because microbes are in the air, and you can pour your solid media once it has slightly cooled, you can pour it in, and usually this will hold about 20 mLs, right? So 20 mL. So let's say if you made 100 mLs of this solid media, you can make about five, five of these um, Petri dishes that will contain solid media. So you pour it in, and then what you will do is that you will, you will allow it to cool at room temperature, so that way it will turn solid. So it turns into this solid or this gel, you put gel, right? It's a solid, it's like a jelly, a gel-like material. And the other great thing about the, or other benefit of agar is that the, since the organism does not use this solid media as food, it is used in order to visualize colonies. So we can actually see the organisms that are growing. Right, and when we're looking at many different organisms, sometimes they present different patterns of growth. All right, so different organisms can will have different patterns of growth. So if you're working, but if you're working in a laboratory with a certain organism, sometimes uh, or or most times you will know the way what the way how your organism would look like. And if you see something else growing on this plate on this petri dish, you would know it is not your organism because you would recognize their pattern of growth. Okay. 
So once you make your media, you have to check for pH, right? This is also very important. Um, you need to make sure that your organism is growing in the right condition so that way they do not die. And we separate our organisms into different groups based on the pH requirement. And some organisms are acidophiles. They grow in a pH of zero to six. Um, neutrophiles is around seven, right? And uh, acidophiles will be higher than seven. So the pH scale, if we, we, we're talking about the pH scale, the pH scale goes from zero to 14, all right? In the middle, we have pH seven, which is neutral. Right, so the lower the pH, if we go lower, right, closer towards zero, this is going to be more acidic. And if we go the other way, closer to 14, this is more alkaline or basic. So how would we change the pH of the medium? Let's say we prepared it. Sometimes when we prepare medium, um, because of the, the water that we use, the water might be slightly acidic, or we might add certain salts that may make the medium more and more acidic. So how would we change it from five to seven? All right, so one way that we can change it is by adding, right, we wanna go from five to seven. So right now, where are we? We're somewhere here. We wanna go closer to this way. So if we want to go closer this way, we need to add something that is more basic. So one thing that we use in the lab often will be NaOH, this chemical. And what is that? That's called sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And we also use it as a buffer and this buffer is allowed to, since it's a buffer, it's allowed to, it, it, we use, sorry, we use the buffers in order to change the pH. And it changes the pH without drastically changing or altering 
the media or whatever the, the composition of what we're making because it's able to handle small changes small changes or sorry it's able to, to handle large changes in the pH so so here goes our strong base base is able to handle these strong changes in pH without again drastically changing the composition of what we've already prepared for our bacterial cells. Right so again when we're growing our organisms Lots of things to consider. One, you have to consider how fast they grow. Do they need oxygen or not? You have to consider what type of nutrients do we need to provide for them? Um, is the pH of the medium right? And once you do all this, the next thing you want to do, if you're growing an organism, a specific organism, you need to sterilize your medium. And in our laboratories, um, we use the autoclave, which is a machine that uses pressure, both pressure and steam. So steam is, is moist heat, um, and this allows us to denature our proteins. So once we, and we'll talk about this term, denature, once we denature the proteins, the proteins of the cell are damaged. As we went over in lecture one, when the, our, as we went over in lecture one, our proteins, we need them present so that way they can do the work for the cell and the cell will be alive. But if the proteins are damaged, then the cell doesn't work and the cells will die. So the typical conditions, 15 PSI, PSI, um, that stands for pounds, right? Pounds is standard unit, pounds per square inch, right? And this is the temperature. Whenever you set the autoclave, the temperature, has to be exact, the pressure has to be constant, so these two have to be constant, and for 15 minutes or more, right? If you have lots of things to sterilize, lots of media, you want to use more time, right? More time or more, right? More time, longer exposures if you have more media. So if you were preparing 100 mLs, of nutrient broth or nutrient agar or glucose broth or glucose agar, whatever media, 100 mLs, 15 minutes may be relatively um, sufficient. But if you have, let's say, 2,000 milliliters, you probably want to add more time. More time, the better chance that you will get um, exposure, proper exposure to heat. So we use, we sterilize our media once we've made it and we prepare the media, we will sterilize it. So again, take the media, you mix all your ingredients, right, you check the pH, and now you sterilize it. And when you sterilize, there's different autoclaves. This is a small autoclave. This one is about the size, very small, about the size of a microwave, right, so it's very tiny, heavier, a lot heavier than a microwave, however. And then we have a lot large autoclave that is used, um, something like this is used in our um, science labs and in the science building, and this is of course a lot larger. You can fit greater quantities of materials inside. And whenever you're placing any chemicals, any media inside, you want to check your MSDS for all the ingredients. Um, MSDS material safety data sheets, all right, um, for any chemicals that you have in a laboratory or clinical setting. If this, these material data safe, material safety data sheets will tell you um, how they will behave in different environments. Are they flammable? Are they explosive? What is their behavior when you expose them to this level of heat and pressure? And you also want to, if you're, you're going to autoclave a media, you want to place your liquid or solid media in glassware that is heat resistant. So Pyrex is one example. Pyrex, you may even have it in your home, probably had it in your home for years. Um, you maybe your parents had this, this um, these Pyrex glassware for years, and they last forever. And they can tolerate, not forever, well, relatively forever, and they can, but they can tolerate lots of heat, and they are heat resistant. Of course, you wouldn't put a, a wine glass or a drinking glass in the autoclave because it would break, right?
right? And those are not heat resistant glassware. So you, you do need to make sure that you're using specific glassware that can measure, sorry, that can tolerate the heat. The other thing you want to do before you, you put your materials um, in, in the autoclave, you want to place your autoclave tape or your autoclave indicator on your materials that you will place. So if you have a bottle containing media and you're going to put it inside the autoclave, you want to place this autoclave tape or indicator. And what will happen is that if you look at the color here, it will change from like a neutral or yellow color to black or blue once the autoclave conditions have been met. Um, 121 degrees Celsius and 15 pounds per square inch, square inch. Once those conditions have been met, we know that we're going to be sterilizing the materials. And when the materials are sterilized, this means that all of the living organisms will die, including your endospores, right? So everything will, will be dead um, and they will not survive this temperature and pressure condition. So here we have our autoclave. Again, we put all our materials inside, and when we're ready for this autoclave, we will pull the lid up, and then we'll set our temperature, our conditions on the automatic dial on the side. And make sure that it's 121 degrees Celsius, 15 pounds per square inch. And of course, the time will vary depending on how much materials you put inside. If you put a little bit, 15 minutes might be sufficient. Um, but if you have a lot of materials that you're placing inside, you want to add more. And once you, once you put your materials inside and you close this and turn this on and the pressure builds up, you can't just open it, right? That pressure will contain and close, seal this autoclave. So you would have to exhaust, let the autoclave re release all of that um, pressure um, before you can open up the autoclave, right? So this, um, if you have a pressure cooker at home, maybe you don't, maybe your parents might have a pressure cooker work similarly, where, uh, of course, once you're cooking something um, and this pressure cooker is closed, you have to wait for the steam and the pressure, of course, to all exhaust before you can open it up. Okay, so once your, once your materials are autoclave after um, how much ever time you left it there, you let it cool slightly and then you get ready, ready to pour it into your different environments. Usually we place our liquid into the test tube and the test tubes, and you guys have test tubes like this in your lab where it's easy to work with, the caps put, pull off and push back on, very easy. Um, they're not screwed tight. If they're screwed, there's a little bit more maneuvering um, in order to open them. And then you have your, then you would, for your solid media, usually we place it in the empty petri dishes, so it will look something like this. Here's the, the gel um, of the, the solid media that you have. So again, we place them in petri dishes. All right, so we add, once it's autoclave, we add it to our our containers, whether it's test tube or petri dishes, and once it's in the test tube or petri dishes, then you can start to grow um, whatever organism you want. So let's say you want to grow your organism from that urine sample, then you would put it on here because we know we will, we will either put it in the test tube or on the petri dishes. It, it depends on how you want to grow your organism, but we will place it in these conditions that we know are sterile. And when we grow, let's say, our urine sample in a sterile environment, we know that we're only growing what's in that urine. We're not growing anything else. Just like when the laboratory technician is trying to grow E. coli for you, she grows E. coli in sterile liquid or sterile solid uh, media, so that way she knows that she's only growing E. coli. She doesn't want any other contaminants, from outside growing when she's trying to grow E. coli or when she's trying to grow something specific. Once you have added your media to the different containers, whether the test tube or petri dish, 
then you're ready to inoculate. And this is something that you will be doing in the lab. Inoculating, you can use different instruments. Here is your metal loop. So this will be your metal loop. You guys have already used this in the lab, and you guys will use it to grow microorganisms as well. The metal loop allows you to transfer microorganisms. So if you wanted to transfer microorganisms, let's say from urine to the test tube, or from, from the urine container of urine to the Petri dish that has your nutrients. Or for our laboratory technicians, she would be transferring, we have in our laboratory, we have organisms that are our E. coli will be in a fro usually in a frozen preparation and she can add it to the test tube or petri dishes that have nutrients so they can start their growth um, and go through the, the four phases of growth. So when you inoculate, inoculate means that you're transferring, you're transferring or adding microbes to medium. And when we're, we're transferring, we're not transferring it anywhere, we're transferring it to medium. Medium has nutrients, food, so that way the organism can grow. So that's the most important thing. It has, it has to, when we're talking about inoculating, we're moving it to a condition for their growth, and in order for them to grow, they have to have nutrients. Um, for inoculating, for transferring, um, in our laboratory, you'll see that we'll not only use metal loops, we may use toothpicks, we may use, we will use cotton swabs when we get to those experiments, so you guys will see different tools that are used in the laboratory. Um, in the laboratory. But when we're transferring, one other thing that I want to mention, when we're transferring, let's say we're transferring from one area to the next, if we're using the metal loop, what do we need to do to make sure that we don't have any contamination? Yes, we need to sterilize it. So we need to sterilize that metal loop. How do we do that? We stick it into our flame, our Bunsen burner, and then we're ready to transfer from one environment to the next. So after we inoculate, the next step would be to incubate, All right? So you incubate at the right temperature, at the right temperature. Most of our organisms that we work with, they are part of the normal microbiota or they're pathogenic. So since they're um, usually growing with us, we will grow them in the range of 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. And those organisms that grow at that temperature range, they're called mesophiles. So these organisms that grow with us, of course, they're used to sort of our tem temperature. So what temperature do you think would be the best, the optimal for these organisms that grow with us to survive at, to be stable at? What, what temperature? So what temperature are you? What temperature is your body temperature? 37 degrees Celsius. So in the laboratory, we set, in, when we're growing many of our organisms, we set our incubator. An incubator is a machine that holds a stable temperature for a long period of time, so that way we can grow our organisms. All right, so there's different organisms, different groups of organisms, as I mentioned. Most of the ones that we work with will be in this range. two to three days or a few hours, could be even one day, our organisms will grow, all right? And our organisms, one dot, as this arrow is pointing to, one dot is one colony. And each colony has about one million, approximately one million microorganisms, all right? And if you have a high density of growth like this, right, there's more microorganisms over here. So this has way more microorganisms or more bacteria over here. I'll just put more microbes on that side. Okay, so one dot, one million cells. Over here, lots of cells. So when you're performing your gram stain, you only need about the size of three dots. Using three dots will be sufficient for you to see the shapes of your microorganisms after you have prepared your smear and your your, your stain and you have done all this washing and, and maneuvering with the slide, 
uh, about three, the size of three dots. So I would take my metal, if this was my metal root, I'll take my metal root and just grab a small amount of organism with my root, and that should be sufficient for my gram stain smears, to, to prepare my smears for the gram stain. But if you take all the, if you take your root and you take all these cells from this area for your gram stain, it will be way too many for you to observe the shapes that you need in that gram stain. All you would see is this big black, um, purple or pink colored area that would not be reflective, reflective of any shapes. All right, so just be mindful when you're preparing your gram stain, you will repeat the gram stain several times throughout the laboratory. And as you're preparing this gram stain, you should get better. Right, so how do you get better? The first time, if you prepare the gram stain and you see that there are way too many cells and you can't see the shapes, right, then you need to add less bacteria. So what do you do the next time around? You add this amount, not that amount to your slide. When your organisms grow in liquid conditions, they will be turbid. Right, so turbid looks like this, and that word turbid means cloudy. All right, so when we see this cloudiness, right, when we see this cloudiness, we know that microorganisms are present in higher numbers. Right, if there's one microorganism, you can't see it, but when there's many microorganisms, then we can see it, and our liquid media will turn cloudy. So this will be, if we look at A, A will represent uninoculated or before you add in your microorganisms. And B will represent your inoculated, which has microorganisms. So this will look more cloudy, right? Not cloudy, but not, not cloudy. Right, because it's sterilized, and once you transfer microorganisms here, you allow it to grow for a day or so, then it will turn cloudy if there's successful growth. So that should be the indication. Once your organisms have grown, you can store them in cold condition and the cold will slow down their growth, right? Just like if you were to prepare food at home, right? You don't leave the food on the stove after you left it, you don't leave it at room temperature. What do you do? Eventually, before you go to bed or before the night's over or when you're finished with the food, you store it in the refrigerator so it doesn't spoil. Right? Because what happens if you have food, the microorganisms will come. If you have food, the microorganisms will come from the air and then grow on that food. But if you place your food in the refrigerator, what happens? It slows down your growth. So similarly, if you're growing your microorganisms in the lab, we store it in cold conditions after their growth. And we can store it in the refrigerator for up to about two to three weeks. So if you're working in the lab one week and you grow organisms, then you put it in the refrigerator and you can come back the next week and still see them, still observe their growth, um, and you'll still have viable living cells that you can see, you can perform gram stains on and run, run your tests on. So usually about two to three weeks, they'll survive in the refrigerator. And in our laboratory, we also use a, deep, a special deep freezer, this deep freezer, at minus 80 degrees, so it's much colder than if you have a deep freezer in your home or if your parents have a deep freezer that they're using to store food in their home. This is much colder and this allows you to store microorganisms for years. But one of the problems with these very cold temperatures, especially if you're trying to store it at this condition for many, many years, um, you need to add some sort of protective agent. And oftentimes with bacteria, we'll use something like dimethyl sulfoxide, which is a protective, protective chemical, and it will protect the microbe once they're in this cold, cold condition, right? It will protect them from the ice that is forming on the outside of their cell, right? So that way they are not damaged. So um, this is how we would store organisms with um, for long periods of time. And we do have organisms, the, the laboratory technician has many organisms, Staphylococcus, E. coli, bacillus, stored at, 
is stored in the deep freezer so that way they can use it for many, many years. So each semester they will go to the deep freezer, get E. coli, and then start to grow it. So what, how do they start growing it? They will put all their chemicals together, right? Get all their ingredients. They will weigh all their ingredients. And then once they weigh all the ingredients, they make their broth or their agar, right? They check the pH, they sterilize the media, and then they start to add the E. coli from the deep freezer. Then once they add it or inoculate the petri dish or the, the petri dish or the, the test tube, then they will incubate it at 37 degrees Celsius. And from there, you guys will work with it or they can store it in the refrigerator um, for a few days until it's ready to be used.